Hello, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, hello, everyone. My name is um, Ashish Jha, and uh, I am an assistant professor at um, NYU um, Abu Dhabi. And welcome to the CAGS uh, webinar series today. We're going to talk about um, big data in genomics today. We have three fantastic speakers with us. The first um, in line um, um, is um, Julia Baptista. Um, she is a scientist at the Exeter Genomics Lab, um, leading the National Exome Service for the NHS patients with rare genetic diseases. Julia's work is focused on solving rare disease and ending the diagnostic odyssey for families. She's interested in how genomic testing, especially in early age, can improve outcomes for patients um, and their families, and in how um, rare genomic variation impacts on human health and disease. A keen educator, Julia is a member of the European School of Genetic Medicine, providing course in genomics and cytogenetics to the international healthcare community and she is an honorary lecturer in genomics medicine at the University of Exeter Medical School. Julia is also the Southwest Genomic Laboratory Hub Rare Disease Scientific Lead for Genomic Education and has been elected as a board member of the European Society of um, Human Genetics. So um, before um, I ask Julia to present, I should have done this. Um, any question you have, and I know you may have a lot of questions, must be written in the Q&A box. Um, the questions will only be answered during the Q&A panel discussion at the end of the session. So all three presenters are going to present and we're going to have a Q&A session towards the end um, of the session today. Uh, you can, um, your, the questions written in the box will be answered at that time. Um, the CME certificates can, can be downloaded as of uh, tomorrow uh, from the link provided. Um, and uh, please do remember to answer the short uh, survey at the end of this web, uh, webinar. And uh, this is Julia. Julia, um, please go ahead. Um, hello, good evening. Um, I will, um, it's again great pleasure to be here today and tell you a little bit about the work that we have been doing in the UK. Um, doing a rapid exome sequencing in babies and children that are acutely unwell. Um, I hope you can see my presentation okay. So, um, as a part of the vision of the United Kingdom for uh, genomic medicine, that vision is about mainstreaming where genomics um, and genetics, it's not only for clinical genetics uh, specialities, but for the mainstream clinician, for the neurologist, for the neonatologist, and for other specialities. As part of that vision, we had a reorganization of genomic uh, laboratory hubs, and I am part of the Southwest Genomic Laboratory Hub uh, between Exeter and uh, the Bristol Genomics uh, Laboratory. And the, 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 the aim of reorganizing genomics um, in the UK is mainly to uh, make genomic testi testing more accessible and equitable for the country's population. As part of the work that we've been doing um, in genomics, we are looking at uh, uh, establishing national standards and protocols that everybody can use throughout uh, the UK having a single national testing directory and ensuring that patients, irrespective of where they live, they can access um, genomic testing um, in a fast uh, uh, manner if there is need for that. So part of that vision is also to bring this uh, uh, national exome sequencing uh, 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 service. And the service was launched on the 1st of October, 2019. And it's mainly aimed at, as I said, babies and children that are acutely unwell. So these babies and children will typically be um, in hospital, in intensive care uh, units, um, and uh, there will be the feeling that they do have a monogenic disorder, 
And having a, a, a diagnostic uh, um, uh, for those children can have an impact on how they are managed in that setting. And perhaps there will be treatment implications as well. The exome analysis that we are doing is, of course, um, imperfect. Um, and the vision is that we will move from exomes to genomes. But whilst we await that transition that is, is happening, um, we are offering this um, exome analysis, looking at less than 2% of the human genome. We are using a commercial kit uh, to do this um, uh, uh, capture. And uh, most of the analysis that we are doing um, are not uh, focused on specific genes or gene panels. What we are doing instead is a gene agnostic approach in most cases, where we, we are essentially analyzing all 23,000 uh, human genes. So it is a hypothesis, gene hypothesis free uh, approach. So most of what I thought I would tell you uh, today um, is based on what happened in the first year of the service. Um, how, uh, how, uh, how many patients have we tested? What was the makeup of those uh, patients that we tested? And then more importantly, which lessons have we learned uh, from uh, our experience in delivering rapid um, exomes? So in the first year of the service, we tested uh, 510 patients. And the vast majority of those patients, as I said, were babies that were in neonatal intensive care or in pediatric intensive care. We did have open some uh, exceptions and we um, um, did test the patients that were not in those settings, but they uh, uh, made up the bulk of, of the referrals. In terms of strategy for exome analysis, we prefer to do a trio analysis where we analyze the acutely unwell baby and both unaffected parents. But sometimes it's not possible to have uh, samples from both parents in a timely uh, uh, manner. And in those cases, we might be able to do a due analysis where we have uh, the child and one of the parents, or um, it might be appropriate to test only the child. So those cases are a minor minority, as you can see here. The bulk of the cases, again, are trio um, exomes. A little bit more about the makeup of uh, the patients that have been referred through this service. Uh, most of them were in neonatal intensive care. There was an equal split of uh, boys and girls. And if you look at the age of the patients at the time of referral, you can see that 80% were uh, neonates or babies that were under one year of age. In terms of referrals, as I said, the vision is the mainstream uh, uh, genomics and genomics testing. So although clinical genetics um, still makes up the vast majority of the um, referring teams, we also get uh, referrals from the neonatologists, neurology, from metabolic uh, consultants, for example, and also from cardiologists. Um, many of those specialities work alongside um, uh, genetics. And um, one of the lessons that we learned from our experience is that um, the best results are given when you have these multidisciplinary teams working together, bringing different expertises um, to help us get the right answer. Um, the majority of the population that we are testing um, is uh, uh, white uh, and white British, but um, we also have uh, tested um, uh, uh, a big proportion of uh, patients from um, Asian uh, backgrounds um, and from a black or a mixed uh, uh, background. And again, that is useful so that we can also um, learn about uh, variation in those different uh, uh, groups. This is a map of the UK with uh, uh, the spread of the referrals. And um, what this is trying to show is that we got referrals from across the country, um, of course, with some uh, um, um, concentration, if you are like, or clustering in the regions that are more densely populated. Um, in terms of turnaround time and how fast do we want to be delivering exome sequencing um, results to patients, we want to do this as fast as we can. We set a target of 21 calendar days 
from a sample received into the laboratory until we communicate the, um, the results to the clinician. We are often um, uh, much faster than the 21 days. We sometimes uh, manage to do this in a time frame of five, six, to seven days, but for 93% of all the referrals that we got, we uh, reached our target of 21 days. When we don't reach our target of 21 days, it's typically not because of a technological uh, limitation, but because we've identified a variant of uncertain significance and we need um, additional testing, additional phenotyping of the patient before we can release a diagnostic report with the result. So how good are we at picking up a diagnosis uh, for these patients? Um, it's pretty much in line with a literature that you will find on not only exome sequencing, but genome sequencing. The diagnostic yield tends to be around 30 to 40 percent, um, irrespective of the test that you apply. Um, and that is exactly what we are seeing. Uh, in the first year, we um, identified diagnosis for 38 uh, percent of these babies and children. Um, I will say that in some cases, um, we run exome analysis in parallel to other tests. For example, if you are thinking about a child with a clinical picture of hypotonia, where you could have a, a, a spinal muscular atrophy as a diagnosis, we know there's a pseudogene in there, and we know that exome sequencing is not the best test to detect um, uh, variants in that uh, gene. So what we do is, um, in some cases, we advise clinicians to activate different tests in parallel. Um, and the other, the other thought is, for example, a methylation defect. Um, we will not pick those by exome analysis. So we often have um, uh, multiple tests going on in parallel to make sure that we can get a fast reply for these um, uh, patients. I will also touch on incidental findings, so findings that are unrelated to the reason why we tested the baby. We don't tend to uh, find many of those, and uh, but we do find some. And again, uh, the key here is to have a discussion with the clinical teams and try to decide what is appropriate to include in the diagnostic report. What we really want to be doing with uh, early exome sequencing analysis is to identify that proportion of ch children and babies that have a treatable uh, uh, disorder. So we looked very closely at what is the impact of having that uh, early diagnosis. And um, in some cases, it might be a referral to a, a specialist. For example, if you find um, a, a, a cardiac uh, defect, that then means that the child, the child would benefit from a transplant. Um, and uh, in some cases, um, uh, some sad cases, you might find that you identify the diagnosis that um, does not have a good um, uh, long-term prognosis for the child. Um, uh, you might, for example, in the case of the epilepsies, you might be thinking about changing the treatment that is being given, given to the children, um, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Um, in, so we found that uh, in 94% of the cases, the result that we've identified through rapid exome sequencing was useful and uh, 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 changed the, the, the treatment or the management of that patient. We had uh, also two cases of a rare immunodeficiency. Um, these were um, included patients with COVID. So if you have a baby that is very ill with COVID, um, we uh, did include those patients in, in, our, uh, um, um, in our service. And the rationale for that is that you don't expect uh, babies to end up uh, with severe COVID. So that might be a sign that they have a genetic predisposition and in this case, an immunodeficiency that makes them get very ill with COVID. So we did find uh, uh, um, that as well. If we look at the different uh, types of phenotypes um, that we had um, in this cohort, 
Um, most of the patients that we uh, see have some sort of neurological uh, presentation. So 60% um, uh, nearly had um, regression. Some might have a neurometabolic presentation that makes you think maybe they have something um, mitochondrial. Many patients with hypotonia, um, a, a big category of patients with skeletal uh, 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 presentations. Um, as well. And, and what I'm showing you here is also how successful, um, uh, sorry, how successful will be uh, also at identifying a diagnosis um, in, in these different categories. Um, and um, the high drops category, for example, jumps out as a region where we are not very successful and probably that's it, that is an indication that many of those children don't have a monogenic uh, uh, disorder. So if we uh, uh, summarize some of uh, the findings of our uh, first year delivering this rapid uh, uh, exome service, we found 38% uh, uh, of uh, diagnose, uh, diagnostic yield of 38% with 94% uh, of diagnosis leading to those um, uh, um, so useful uh, clinical man management uh, changes and implications. So we can say that it was a highly successful uh, 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 service. One of the things that we wanted to look at was what, what was the uptake of the service throughout uh, the country. And uh, we, we, we've shown that we had a good uh, uptake across England with referrals from the different regions, a mix of ages and ethnicities. Um, and uh, the key message for us was this uh, um, um, close multidisciplinary working, not only um, uh, amongst the different clinical teams, but also us as scientists um, and uh, in the laboratories working together with bioinformaticians to improve our pipelines, um, working together with our technical teams, um, and then our interaction as a laboratory with the clinical teams um, that has been hugely um, successful. And in terms of uh, lessons and areas for improvement, the big area for improvement that um, um, jumped out to all of us was education. Um, if, um, if we now are able to deliver um, genomic services um, um, easily because we have the technology available to us, what we now need to work on is to make sure that the people that are uh, receiving results from genomic testing understand um, not only genomics, but also understand the limitations of what we did. And when we don't identify a diagnosis, it's important to understand that we only looked, if we did an exome, only looked at less than 2% of the human genome. So it could well be that it's a genetic disorder, but our test is not uh, perfect and will not identify all the causes. So we've been doing a lot of work um, around targeted education. Um, we also found that sample collection was one of the areas where we need to work on um, and, and look at pathways. So we are in Exeter, as you've seen, we are um, in the southwest uh, of the country and we are receiving samples from all across the country. So we need to think about um, fast pathways to make that blood sample arrive um, to us in a timely manner. And um, how do we discuss testing with patients and with parents of these babies and make sure that uh, the parents understand what we are doing um, and what are the limitations of our test? And of course, we need to do this big transition from exome to genome. Um, and uh, how, um, how many more variants are we going to find when we do genomic uh, testing? Um, and we look forward to being able to be able to detect structural variants, uh, variants that are um, in the non-coding uh, space um, and all other types of variants that we can't find uh, with the current technology that we are using. So looking very much forward uh, to a future where we can increase diagnostic yield um, and, and find more answers for families. Of course, the work that I presented today is um, the work of many colleagues. And um, uh, a few weeks ago, we, um, as the Rapid Exome Sequencing Service in Exeter, were awarded uh, Excellence in Healthcare Delivery 
award um, uh, due to the work that we've been doing uh, for these uh, uh, acutely and well uh, babies and children. So we are immensely grateful um, to uh, have had the opportunity to learn so much and contribute so much to the field of genomics um, and, and, and look forward to what the future holds for all of us. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Julia. It was a great presentation and <clears throat> congratulations for um, uh, on winning the award. Um, and I am our next speaker um, is um, Dr. Sharif um, Nahas. Um, let me see. Um, can uh, just give me one second. I think I'm having an issue with uh, sharing here. Just, um, share. Um, yeah, so um, our next speaker is Dr. Sharif Nahas. Um, Dr. Nahas um, is the laboratory director at Rady uh, Pediatric um, Clin uh, Genomic and S uh, Systems Medicine Institute. Dr. Nahas is a clinical uh, molecular geneticist certified by the American Board of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and he's a fellow of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. Prior to joining Rady um, Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine, he received his PhD in molecular toxicology in 2008 at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and subsequently com um, completed a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical molecular genetics in 2011 at UCLA and Cedars um, Sinai Medical Center. Following completion of his clinical fellowship, he became the laboratory director at Ambry Genetic, uh, Genetics in Aliso Viejo. California in July 2011. In 2013, he accepted a position at Xenoptics Medical Laboratory, um, which is a Novartis company, as their director of clinical genomics. In his director roles, he worked to improve the lab uh, um, laboratory's work workflow, which enabled them um, to implement new diagnostic technologies such as clinical diagnostic exome, quantitative oncology assays, and FDA-approved molecular diagnostic tests. In addition, he helped develop and implement laboratory automation, chromosomal microarray, and a variety of next-generation sequencing platforms for clinical diagnostic use. Between 2011 and, 2000, and October 2016, he supervised testing of over 50,000 cases covering genetic disease such as fragile X, hereditary hemorrhagic um, telangiectasia, I'm having difficulty pronouncing it, um, cystic fibrosis and pancreatitis, next generation sequencing for hereditary cancer panels, X-linked mental retardation, clinical diagnostic exome, HNPCC, Marfan syndrome, and Marfan-related disorders. Uh, plus, primary ciliary um, dyskinesia, myelodysplastic syndrome, lung cancers, ac um, acute myeloid leukemia, and others. He was responsible for the review of laboratory test results data and ongoing quality control and quality assurance associated with these tests. In 2016, he accepted a position with Rady Children's Institute of Genomic Medicine to help the development and operations of whole genome sequencing of critically ill children in the Institute's rapid NICU-PQ uh, genomics laboratory. Dr. Nahan, Nahas has also first authored or co-authored over 40 peer-reviewed publications. So Dr. Nahas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the screen okay? So it's very, first off, very nice presentation, uh, Dr. Batista, it was, uh, and congratulations for all of your uh, important work. I also wanna thank the uh, organizers and everyone attending. I'm very happy to be speaking with everyone today. So for today's talk, I'll be discussing the development of a system uh, for delivery of rapid 
genomic sequencing um, to enable management of childhood genetic diseases. Um, just want to also mention, while this work was performed during my time and after at Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine in San Diego, California, I've now moved on to Infinity Biologics in Piscataway, New Jersey, as full-time as the uh, Chief Scientific Officer earlier this year, um, where we utilize genomics to unlock really valuable data in any biological sample in order to make um, health innovation easier. So this is just a high level overview of what I already mentioned in the title, but also using a case example to demonstrate an automated pipeline for the delivery of genomic information, resulting in patient management under 14 hours. In addition, I hope to uh, demonstrate these concepts using a clinical case and how it can be expanded for critically ill infants. From there, move on to some future directions and possibilities for such technologies and developments. Just briefly, um, some of you may have heard of Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institute of Health. And in 2014, there were some real realizations of how genomics and genomic sequencing would impact the future of healthcare. He went on to say that over the course of the next few decades, the availability of cheap, efficient DNA sequencing technology will lead to a medical landscape in which each baby's genome uh, is sequenced. And that information is used to shape a lifetime of personalized strategies for disease prevention, detection, and treatment. And I think Julia highlighted that well. Just a little bit of background. So if you look at the cost of a genome on the left-hand side here in, 2014, in 2004, it was around 18,000 US dollars um, to sequence a genome. And in 2020, we're certainly seeing the cost come down to below around uh, $700 for sequencing. In parallel on the right-hand side, we've seen the time and hours to complete a genome assay for clinical use from 2004, from over 110,000 hours to now just under 14 hours based on recent publications. So just a few statistics to highlight the importance of returning these high quality rapid genetic results within the intensive care units. Um, on average, week within the United States, there are roughly 74,000 live births, and close to 3,000 of those are born with one of some 8,000 or so known genetic diseases. From these, you know, unfortunately, about 450 babies die before their first birthday. Now, for these reasons, we obviously see large opportunities for the biggest impact for rapid diagnostics within intensive care units by developing a comprehensive genetic test that will help provide timely targeted treatments and hopefully result in better patient outcomes. So I'm talking about a system of, uh, for delivery of rapid genomic sequencing to enable this type of management of childhood genetic diseases. It's a very detailed process that requires a number of important interconnected parts between translational genomic research to genomic learning systems, and with a certain amount of new genomic knowledge to drive both um, infrastructures. And if we just get a little bit more granular, you know, it's a system-based approach that's overseen by governance, policy, quality, and leadership. It involves the earliest possible ascertainment of patients, uh, assessment of patient ascertainment. How do you get that sample as quickly as possible? How do you identify that? From awareness to ordering of the test, uh, performing the actual assay to sample collection and reporting of the results. But how are those reports delivered? You know, historically, it's been typically returning a result and the physician deals with it. But, you know, now they really should be delivered with precision medicine in mind, you know, hopefully leading to some therapeutic innovation. Or intervention. So, what does this process look like now? Um, again, from a sample, from a sample from a critically ill infant is collected, and in parallel, a few things are happening. As opposed to just going straight into prep and sequencing, which traditionally has happened, um, well, samples are prepped and sequenced. There's some alignment and variant calling that occurs. Um, clinical features now or phenotypes are being extracted from the medical records automatically. And in this case, in the, in the case I'll highlight later, we'll see this more. So this, is, this is by a system called, um, which I'll highlight as well, ClinyThink, and that uses natural language processing to perform this process. The features are automatically added to VCF files and input into an automated diagnosis system. 
example here is Fabric Genomics, it's a tertiary analysis system, and Moon automated callers. From there, automated reports, <clears throat> which are we're calling gene to treatment, are generated and returned directly to care physicians for implementation of rapid precision medicine. I'll go into further detail as well about the uh, what gene to treatment is and the and the reporting process. Before I do that, let's take a little closer look at uh, natural language processing and how that is important for, for delivering these type of results. So first of the patient's phenotypic features are extracted from non-structured text fields in the electronic health records using NLP from a system like ClinyThink. NLP identified an average typically of 89 human phenotype um, ontology terms, HPO features that include both exact matches and their hierarchical root terms per patient in about 20 seconds. I think anybody who's done this before has, uh, has uh, dug deep into medical records, but typically um, compared with the manual review, it could take several hours per record. Secondly, for each patient, extracted HPO terms are compared with known HPO terms for all approximately 6,000 genetic diseases. Now each genetic disease is assigned a likelihood of being causative of a diagnosis based on the number of matching terms and their information content. talk a little bit about the um, interpretation software. So the automated interpretation software like Gem and Moon from the systems I, I, I mentioned a little earlier, that reduce the time and analytical expertise needed to make these molecular diagnoses. So these tools use various machine learning techniques to prioritize and rank variants. So briefly, the pathogenicity of each variant detected by rapid genome sequencing is calculated by database lookup and by prediction of variant consequence for the associated protein. A provisional genetic diagnosis is generated by rank ordering the integrated scores um, of phenotype similarity and pathogenicity. The provisional diagnosis contains either none or one of a only a few genetic diseases at the end of it. So I mentioned uh, gene to treatment, what we call GTRX. You know, what is it? Well, um, GTR. GTRX provides a fast, easy to use management guidance for intensivists when they have a new diagnosis of a rare genetic disease. It's essentially an automated report with uh, any human intervention from the time sequencing is complete to the delivery of translational information. Typically it takes reviewers, some of you on this particular um, uh, webinar will understand it can take reviewers of genomic information about four to six hours um, to review each condition um, associated. So this is a consolidation of translational information for a diagnosis and treatment in an automated fashion. In the next slides, I'll review in a bit more detail, but at a high level here, there was a review of 5,762 disease caused, disease, <clears throat> diseases caused by about 4,000 or so genes. Of those about close to 400, or about 350 or so genes kind of met the inclusion criteria in this program. Those that with a direct treatment, and that's the key here, from there, a number of interventions and publications were reviewed. Um, we identified about 411 interventions that were related to genes um, were retained in this product that ranged from surgeries, diet, medication, devices. These were then categorized as curative, effective, or unproven. So let me take a step backwards um, a bit on, uh, on how this was uh, done. Um, and how everything was interrogated. So the first steps involved the development um, and involved surveys of the numerous existing web-based information resources for genetic diseases. Most were unstructured, thinks people can understand that, and incomplete and not intended for use by any frontline physicians. Uh, data sets were obtained from OMIM, ORFNET, Genetic and Rare Disease Information Center, Gene Reviews, and others listed in this particular figure. Transformation pipelines were used with uh, an information miner to match entries, normalize, and merge them. Unifying gene definitions were from RefSeq and genetic disease definitions from mapping between OMIM and ORFNET. Um, OMIM identify identities were also used. Uh, so unifying HPO phenotypes were then mapped back to OM OMIM and ORFNET. After all of this and a number of collaborations with many partners, a web resource uh, was developed called Gene to Treatment to automatically display this information and link it to an automated whole genome sequencing results on a gene by gene basis. A 
Here's just an example, a um, really high level of some of the curated genes and associated diseases ranging from epilepsies through metabolic disorders, mitochondrial, as well as nervous system um, disease. I think even maybe even the most important thing here is, is the data platform that uh, you need to develop to harvest all of this information. So with all of this information, you know, it, it's very, very important to develop a dynamic data platform and encompasses a lot of things such as data governance to ensure contract and research protocols are favorable for data science. They're interoperable, allowing granular data and access and controls. This also includes strong API capabilities that can support ingestion and export into standard formats and really should also be scalable and on demand and easy to develop and visualize. Maybe even more important, be able to search across diseases, conditions using internal and external data with associated phenotypes and possible treatment outcomes. All right, so let's move on to the uh, case example here. Hopefully it uh, demonstrates um, this particular system and the importance of it. So this particular diagnosis was made within 13 and a half hours. This was a five week old, previously healthy female who presented to the emergency department at Rady Children's Hospital with inconsolable crying for two hours, extremely irritable and had a change in cry. The patient had downward eye deviations noted on a neurological examination, and the parents were consanguineous or related. So at 10.49 p.m., the patient presented to the emergency department, again, with inconsolable crying for about two hours. The patient was admitted to the NICU, and a detailed family history was obtained. A stat head computa uh, computed tomography suggested profound hypoxic ischemia injury with basal ganglia damage. And you can see that here on the right side of this uh, screen. What I think is even more profound in this particular example is that the patient had a sibling sister that presented in the same manner at the same age. Fortunately, the sister died undiagnosed nine years ago at the age of one with seizures and profound developmental delay. And again, you can see to the right, here that the patient and the sister's tomography had very, very similar features. At 12.30 uh, p.m. on uh, day of life 42, the neonatology and genomics to discuss the patient and authorize a rapid whole genome sequencing to be performed. Blood samples are drawn, 3.52 p.m. The sample arrived to the genomic center and preparation commenced and sequencing started a little under two hours later. The next day of life, day life 43, at 6.30 a.m. sequencing finished and bioinformatics pipeline started. One hour later at 7.34, a provisional diagnosis was conveyed and around 8 a.m. EEG had also identified frequent seizures in this patient. Close to 8.30 a.m., again, the diagnosis and treatments were discussed. The patient was diagnosed with autosomal recessive biotin thiamine responsive basal ganglia disease, resulting from a homozygous pathogenic um, duplication of a T variant in the thiamine transporter 2G, which makes sense because the parents were consanguineous. 12.13, the first doses of biotin and thiamine were administered. And at 6 p.m., irritability was resolved and the baby started feeding. After a few days of observation, in the morning on day life 46, the patient was discharged home and is doing well now. Just taking a closer look at a high level overview of each of the steps and the timing involved. And as you can see, it was really this interconnected process of natural language processing, automated diagnosis, informatics, and management and guideline with really no human intervention once the sample was on a sequencer. So what's the future of this? You know, future of GTRx or gene treatments, it's an integration with genome analysis software that clinician can control the results. 
hopefully crowdsourced treatment um, response and support for clinical trial enrollment, all with the plan for physicians to be in control of what information they see along with up to up to date dynamic management guidance. Um, and again, it should include clinical trial information and the integration of a lot of automated genome analysis software. So this is what we see as, as the future. Really happy to say that uh, from when I first started, uh, when I first started um, in 2016, um, Radies and maybe a few others were taking on this particular type of testing, but now it's expanded throughout the United States. And the different colors here depict the number of hospital partners implementing rapid genome sequencing within their intensive care units. They're now over a total of 60 sites across 25 states and actually two international sites as well. I was also happy to see recently that Al Jalila Children's Hospital in Dubai is moving forward with implementation of rapid genomic sequencing within intensive care units as well. And I think everybody there has, has, has realized the importance of this. Um, this particular project. So it's, it's been really good to see the, the news expanding um, throughout the world. Just lastly, just some key points. We know that whole genome sequencing can now provide a provisional diagnosis in 13 and a half hours. Um, obviously, uh, capacity and, uh, and the number of samples that you can sequence is still needs to be worked out within that particular time frame, but now we know it's possible. Um, GTRx can provide immediate management guidance. And in the future, clinicians will be able to order a rapid genome on morning rounds and uh, receive a diagnosis with management plans that same evening. All working to change the paradigm of how genomic data can be used in the clinical setting. With that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the many collaborators and leadership and staff that worked over the years to make this possible. And I really thank you for your time and attention and the organizers of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sharif. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Um, I am hoping to get this right this time. Okay, seems like I did. Um, that was um, a, a great presentation. I am sure people are going to have a lot of questions um, to, uh, during our Q&A session. I do. Um, but uh, for now, um, I would like to introduce our third and final speaker, um, Andres Hancho. Um, he is from Khalifa um, University here in UAE, so he's our neighbor. Um, and his book is uh, Genotype Phenotype um, Predictions um, Using Genomic Data Science, um, Enabling um, Machine Learning for Understudy Populations, which is fantastic. So let me um, tell you a little bit about who Andres is. Um, he received um, his MSc and PhD in Computer Science from the Technical University of Dresden, which is in Germany in 2002 and 2008 respectively. He joined Maslar Institute as a postdoc um, researcher in 2009. In 2011, he became assistant professor at Maslar Institute, UAE. He spent one year at the Massachusetts um, Institute of Technology, MIT, um, in the US as a visiting scholar. His research focuses on um, genomic data science and bioinformatics, which are at the intersection of healthcare and the AI data science in the Khalifa University research ecosystem. In his capacity as a bioinformatics project leader of the Khalifa University Center for Biotechnology, he is currently heading the UAE population stratification analysis using large scale data. The creation of large scale whole genome sequencing pipelines and the development of bioinformatics tools used for microbiome as well as genetic data generated by internal collaborators. He recently co-led the development of the first UAE major um, allele reference genome. So without any further ado, Andres, um, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. We can see me. Um, sorry. Yes, we can. Uh, I can see myself. Um, can you? Yes, can we you can see, see you. We can see you. you can can you see my screen also? No, we cannot. Not now. And one second. Um, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for being patient. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. One second. Okay. So. Um, Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for this um, nice introduction and the uh, invitation in the first place is a great honor for me to talk about this topic, um, genomic data science, which is um, dear to my heart and is also, I think, a very timely topic. Um, so I will like to introduce it by talking a bit about the promises and challenges that the field brings and also our personal um, experiences um, at uh, Khalifa University, in particular the Biotech Center, where we did um, quite a bit of uh, genomic uh, uh, sequencing and now we need to handle all the data deluge. So um, we did recently a comparison of uh, big data technology. So a bit to warn you, and, uh, I'm as, as Ashish mentioned, I am a computer scientist by training. So this will be uh, focusing a bit more on um, technology part, like big data technology. So we did a bit of a comparison here. So to know where to go in, in the future. So um, this will also bring me a bit across um, algorithmic advances. Um, in particular, I will strive and, and start a bit of a flame war between traditional statistics and uh, machine learning. As we heard uh, already, Sharif also mentioned it a couple of times. So this is something that's um, introduced um, quite frequently um, due to the rise of, of popularity of AI. And um, one particular topic of AI that I'm um, working on is uh, transfer learning. I'll explain this in detail, and I think it's very suitable to study um, understudied uh, populations. Okay, so my motivation with this is, as I mentioned, understudied uh, populations, and what can we harvest from well-studied populations, for which we have plenty of uh, um, sequencing, plenty of uh, phenot uh, phenotypical information, and so on. And uh, the rationale behind this is that, um, we have um, for um, we assume that the genetic component in complex diseases um, differ from uh, between populations, but are not entirely different. So there there must be some variants that have um, explanatory power in both the well studied and the understudied populations. We are also encouraged and. Um, inspired by recent successes. There's a publication in Nature Genetics 2018, which talks about polygenic risk scores, which makes it, um, I believe, more suitable to also tackle uh, complex uh, diseases, in particular, uh, diabetes 2, coronary artery disease, and breast cancer, which are far from um, um, uh, monogenetic. So, we all know about the pl uh, plummeting costs and um, that this has led to a scalable genomics. Uh, so the sequencing now um, it has become, uh, the cost per uh, genome has really uh, dropped dramatically. And um, on the other hand, we also need to state that um, in the Middle East, we only see 0.08% in um, public database in terms of um, next generation sequencing data. So um, this was, and this was published in Nature a couple of years ago and uh, 2016, and there wasn't a big change since then. So um, the first um, uh, first thing we should um, consider is that the coevolution between the amount of next generation sequencing data that comes um, comes in and uh, the analysis platforms is not optimal. Um, we uh, need to see that uh, plat uh, platforms um, are basically a bit backwards because of, um, well, the conception uh, of them started in early days when data wasn't, uh, wasn't that large. Like my screen sharing. Okay. Um, so the first thing that people uh, usually address um, are genome-wide associa association studies, which which is nice, uh, um, um, well, the, the one thing that we can deal with here is that they are relatively data hungry, um, but often we have a situation where, um, like here in this Manhattan plot, um, we don't really see a single variant that explains, it, uh, explains um, um, the disease very well. So this uh, GWAS work well for um, Mendelian diseases, but beyond that, uh, we are often in trouble. So what we often need to do is um, well, genome-wide association studies for uh, more complex diseases and 
if you do a power analysis there, um, we often need uh, a lot of data. So this is a whole, uh, it's a um, much more data hungry. Here's another little beast. And, and but um, we could also alternatively switch to uh, um, artificial intelligence um, and machine and deep learning, which um, is, well, there's some controversy with it, which, which I'll uh, dig a little bit um, into it. And it's a whole beast altogether. And especially deep learning is also very, very data hungry. Um, so how to deal with all this data? So um, there are big efforts um, worldwide. And so here AstraZeneca is starting to sequence 2 million uh, genomes. We have a similar effort now also in the UAE. Um, now um, we have seen Qatar genome uh, coming along and also um, we have started our own comparably modest approach to uh, sequence more Arab genomes. Okay, one thing that needs to be stated is that um, when, when we do the sequencing, um, the real cost of sequencing is actually higher than we think because the actual data analysis, the downstream, downstream analysis is taking a larger and larger part of those um, projects. It's also worth noticing that the um, ecosystems for the um, analysis um, is maybe very versatile, but um, there are some issues with it. So um, the current best practices um, are very flat file centric. Um, what I mean by that is we have, um, even though we have very large uh, data sets, but we are basically bypassing decades of uh, database uh, development. So mostly information from genome sequencing is stored in, in variant calling fi uh, files or VCF files. Um, and um, that is not optimal for uh, retrieving all kind of um, information. Uh, so the way it looks for, to me as, an, as a computer scientist um, is we are limping along with uh, flat files and uh, this ecosystem is based on, or the foundation of it is um, uh, the variant uh, calling files, um, format, uh, variant call, uh, calling format files. And uh, on top of it, we have um, indexing schemes like Tabix and a whole bunch of annotation tools and um, pipelines uh, like GATK, which we actually used heavily. And um, yeah, there were some uh, moments of uh, frustration with that. So in, instead, we are now looking to better alternatives that are on the horizon that um, make more use of big data technology. And um, there, well, SQL has been around um, and we see in Gemini, but um, we have that included in our comparison. And there's also uh, tools like BigQuery, uh, from, uh, which is on Google Cloud. Um, in, in addition, there are no SQL solutions like VCF Miner, and particularly we will look at um, OpenCGA, which has been used for the Human Genome Variation Atlas. Okay, so short word on the cloud. Um, it's very appealing. I can see how um, this can save you a lot of headache to do, uh, um, well, you don't need to maintain software uh, or hardware and uh, the, um, the capacity of it dwarfs every university high performance computing center. For example, Broad the Broad Institute has adopted Google Cloud uh, for their GATK workflows and they brought down their cost to $5 per sample. So this all sounds very appealing especially also given that um, many of those platforms have addressed um, compliance problem um, or compliance concerns, I should say, privacy concerns um, by uh, claiming to be uh, HIPAA, uh, like Health Insurance um, Protection, the Health Insurance Protection Act, um, which uh, addresses those privacy concerns. However, there's also the Cloud Act. So meaning that uh, American companies like Amazon, Google, even when they operate in other countries, they are obliged uh, to disclose information if there is a warrant. So that's, um, that's definitely a concern. And this also has led to some um, legal or some legislation issues that makes it sometimes impossible to, to use the cloud um, in some countries. So further concerns are, of course, upload time and um, Download is often discouraged, and we often also see after years of development in a on a cloud platform that you end up being locked into that cloud, so, so called network login. So we'll now focus um, on 
on uh, on premise solutions and i will talk, talk a little bit about our uh, particular one so we get our data raw uh, uh, ngs data and snip arrays um, from uh, in our biotech center and um, so over the years uh, we started with the, uh, the first ue genome in 2019 then later on we had four genomes and then this um, gradually increased to 153 genomes and exomes um, and also on the right hand side you see uh, genotype array data which was very helpful um, and uh, which we also started imputing so we have um, now um, a very large database or a relatively large database that we are also integrating so let me talk a bit about the individual components so here is to start with um, genotyping helped us to place the uae in population a bit better we put it in context with uh, 1,000 world samples from the Human Genome Diversity Project. And um, we also combine this with uh, the uh, admixture of um, each sample. So you see there's little pie charts here in contrast to a normal PCA, we actually see the admixture of each individual sample um, while also being placed uh, in proximity according to their principal components. So um, what was good here and uh, what was useful here, we could try, to, once we had this overview from relatively cheap, uh, cheap uh, genotyping, we could um, target our whole genome sequencing in order to be as representative as possible for our reference uh, genome. Uh, so that we made sure that we in sequence from every corner and we also used a phylogenetic analysis for, for this uh, representative analysis. Okay, so um, now for the sequencing part, um, I'd like to mention two aspects here in, in order to be really ready for this uh, data deluge. Um, we uh, started parallelizing this. We uh, got help from our high performance computing center and we managed to parallelize uh, in two different dimensions. So by sample, the first couple of steps can be parallelized um, by sample. And then once we uh, do variant calling for a whole cohort, um, then uh, it is highly recommended to perform joint genotyping, which you do for all samples at once. And uh, we could parallelize this by um, splitting our genomes um, by region and then uh, crunch them region-wise in parallel. So um, another um, slide here on um, telling you a bit about the, the amount of data we're talking about. So. Um, Long story short, if we don't clean up, um, we end up with more than a terabyte um, of data, mainly from the BAM and SAM files um, going uh, through a common tool called GATK that we use here. Um, also the timings, um, you get a bit of an idea here. Um, we actually managed to improve this quite a lot by um, using a tool called Cention, which um, yeah, brought almost a tenfold um, speed up. So what, what you're using here um, is a relatively modest and um, uh, high performance computing cluster. However, um, it's good to have um, the cap um, capacity and the capabilities in-house. Um, actually, people who know uh, uh, HPC, uh, they help, uh, helped us a lot with the resource management. And after all, we still have 4,732 cores and uh, more than 1.2 petabyte of storage. So this was um, good to know, so we can actually wrestle with quite some um, large data sets here. So standing on the um, um, shoulders of giants um, is what we thought um, is best for, for our uh, future steps. So we uh, did our comparison of um, tools and we resorted with OpenCGA, which actually has been used by Genomics England to, uh, see, uh, to deal with uh, 100,000 genomes. And um, it has a, a, a whole lot of um, functionality, all I've ever wished for, plus uh, additional um, things like um, data analysis, data mining uh, for complex queries, but also security and encryption authentication. Um, and of course, the most important part is scalability. So uh, scalability, just to give you a few numbers here um, at Genomics England, uh, there are 20, uh, petabytes of BAM files uh, that they worked on and um, for a 400 terabyte of compressed VCF and they produced more than 1 billion variants um, that uh, they can analyze now. Um, and um, 
So um, OpenCGA has a nice modular structure. Um, it's, first of all, it's open source, so uh, we can also extend it as we as we like, and we are about to do that. We we are writing plugins for for OpenCGA, and we are in tight um, collaboration with uh, Zeta Genomics, um, who is uh, the driving force behind it. So um, it has a nice uh, storage engine, which finally makes use of um, big data tech technology like MongoDB and Hadoop. It also has um, an annotation uh, an, uh, engine uh, called CellBase. Um, and um, as I mentioned, it's very modular. So we can, uh, as, a, as a user, we can, um, uh, it has, it exposes a bunch of libraries in all language, all kind of language like Java, Python, R, and JavaScript. And um, yeah, so, we can um, annotate it, um, or the annotation is also integrated in this. It usually comes with a separate server, and um, it um, is basically an identical to the uh, variant effect, um, the, the VEP um, of, of from Ensemble, so um, the variant effect predictor. Um, so there are 83 million variants that can be annotated uh, with all kind of clinical data. Um, so um, like GNOMAD is probably an, uh, a very in important one cell base, um, oh, sorry, um, cosmic and so on. Um, here's our comparison that we came up with so far. So we lined up OpenCGA with other tools that we used in the past, like Gemini, also Hail and uh, BCF tools and Snipsift. And um, when it comes to annota annotation accessibility and query speed, um, customization, as I mentioned already, writing our own plugins, but also query complexity and the storage of the info column in the VCF files and scalability. I believe OpenCGA is um, really in, um, on the forefront of those tools. And um, there is some, a bit of an entry uh, requirement, so the syntax is uh, not so easy to get uh, your head wrapped around. But um, other than that, I believe um, OpenCGA compares pretty well, which you can also see in the query speed. So here we see that um, the speed, um, for example, just for RS IDs, uh, but also for homozygous genotype, but especially for um, phenotypical information, um, like annotation, uh, annotations that come from cell base. If we in if we look for, for those type of uh, queries, uh, then OpenCGA really excels. It's actually not possible, many of the tools that I mentioned, not straight in a straightforward ma uh, manner. Okay, this concludes my part on the data science, which I now, uh, and I will transition to uh, artificial intelligence and AI here does not, knowing that I'm talking right now to a lot of medical people, AI does not stand for, um, uh, it, it does not. It does not stand for um, audience um, uh, audience uh, intimidation, but it's uh, of course artificial intelligence, which uh, is getting increasingly popular these days, uh, as for example witnessed by Eric Topol's book Deep Medicine, um, and there's still a bit of controversy, which I would um, well. Uh, one of the representatives for the controversy is this little paper here, saying. Um, little paper, uh, it's a review um, um, that shows that uh, clinical prediction models don't really improve with uh, machine learning over, for example, logistic regression. So the important message uh, for me here is, uh, well, it does not necessarily improve, but at least it's on par right now. And, and that's already a, a good enough message for me to move on towards uh, transfer learning. But I can understand that um, given those kind of um, reviews um, that many uh, many uh, people in the in the medical field are a bit um, intimidated by um, all these new uh, deep learning and um, machine learning techniques however so uh, one of the one of the issues i would like to point out is that um, ai is not very good in in explaining the results so um, explanatory ai is a big topic right now for example for image analysis it just tells you oh that's a cat and looking at the network does not help much because it's um, it's a very um, uh, it's a very complex network, and uh, you have to uh, try, um, 
trusted without um, much uh, justification. This, of course, is very critical in, in a clinical decision-making process. Now, however, nonetheless, um, there are approaches to, to deal with some of these um, issues, like, for example, iterative random forests, um, particularly addresses the explanatory AI issue, um, and it also identifies um, interactions of variants, not like the standard uh, GWAS, where you look at variants only in isolation. Um, in addition, um, machine learning often has the problem of curse of dimensionality. Usually, um, a data set or it contains uh, a reasonable amount of features, like in the tens or maybe hundreds maximum, but with um, potentially um, um, having millions of variants, um, then this does not lend itself straight, straightforwardly to machine learning. So um, what we will actually often have to do is a, a proper subset selection where we have to do it in a heuristic manner because all possible um, all possibilities that's, that are just exponentially many and in computer science, we consider this an, an NP complete problem, which um, yeah, basically, uh, doesn't scale well. Scale scales hor horrifically with uh, numbers of variants to, or numbers of features. So we have to keep it low. Um, so what we do right now, we we go with the with the best SNPs. What we mean with best SNPs? So looking at the Manhattan plot. So we still use our classic um, and tra uh, traditional um, stats to to develop uh, p values and and look at the p um, uh, Manhattan plots and uh, and then just go. Um, try to find a reasonable threshold uh, to, to pick the top ones. And um, so we have done this in, the, uh, for example, on, on pancreas cancer, but also here for some oligo and polygenic uh, data sets um, like eye color and uh, type two diabetes. And um, so we have a pre-selection uh, process and we see that actually we get pretty decent accuracy with a range of uh, deep learning methods to predict the uh, phenotypes. These were relatively small data sets, um, which is was a bit frustrating. So um, we are moving on to transfer learning, which um, is one of the solutions to deal with small data sets. So here in a nutshell, how it works is, if you have a large data set, like for example, large uh, image base of 60,000, like uh, here, we will train a parameter rich network. And then if you have to apply it to a small data set, we will fix most of that so we don't retrain it. So we are not prone to overfitting. We just uh, train a small part, the so-called classification head. OK, so how does it work in, uh, in a population scale um, setup um, or in, in, um, in, uh, instead of uh, like a GWAS? Uh, so what we are trying to do is we, we look at um, um, a large population train on um, machine learning model. And then um, we keep most of the um, weights or the parameters fixed and then just leave um, a few parameters um, open to, to be trained or adjusted or repurposed, I should say repurposed to uh, smaller populations. That's the main idea of uh, transfer learning, which uh, they have a manuscript in preparation um, right now. So in order to uh, also deal with uh, the, ready, um, uh, the data deluge readiness, we in, we're taking on uh, the UK Biobank, and this is also good for the transfer learning, uh, as a tra transfer learning test bed, because, well, there are plenty of um, um, populations there, so not just, um, um, in the UK, you have a quite mixed, um, or they, uh, the UK Biobank actually is a good reflection of the in true UK uh, population. And on top of it, we have not just uh, 486,000 genotype arrays, but we also have uh, confounding factors like um, uh, as like um, so, uh, like you see here on the on the, on the right hand side, um, and also family history, as well as um, well phen deep phenotypes. Okay, so um, first thing we did, um, looking at those 486,000 uh, samples, we wanted to get an overview and um, nice uh, one first nice observation. This looked actually similar to the plot I showed you earlier. So we have a bit of a stretch of um, these two axes in our, our, our principal component analysis, where we see 
uh, at the apex, uh, we see the um, British, Irish, or white population, and then we have here the in red the African or uh, related to African or Sub-Saharan African, and um, and on the other side we have the um, Indian or Asian uh, population. So we can clearly see this. Um, there are uh, clear uh, clusters, and we also when we look at the numbers, we have plenty. Not just I mean obviously the majority is uh, British or uh, white uh, background uh, of white ethnicity but we also have uh, the other ethnicities uh, well represented, so that uh, lends itself nicely to the transfer, um, transfer learning idea that I just explained. So here are a few, um, a few more samples. You see it gets, it gets slightly more messy, but um, um, well, PCA uh, still can help us to do the clustering, even if the self-reported ethnicity is not, um, not optimal. So we get a bit of um, a better appreciation if you look at this in 3D. So um, here we see that um, the proximity in between our samples is um, um, quite visible and um, we see some nice uh, clusters between um, on, on, the, on the population. So that means we do, we can have a test bed for uh, machine learning or transfer learning in particular, uh, seeing how well, for example, a model trained on British white ones can, uh, can be adjusted to the other uh, populations. And here in this case, we do have a, a reasonable amount, but there are many populations of world, like I mentioned, the Arabs, uh, that uh, where we don't have enough data to, uh, to verify. So we can use that model and just um, do the fine tuning with a few uh, samples. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, I'd like to say in, we are kind of um, preparing ourselves to be ready for the genomic data deluge that uh, we uh, anticipate. And um, we are, uh, in doing so, we are standing on the shoulders of giants we, uh, with the help of um, OpenCGA that has been successfully used in the Genomics England UK 100K project. And um, luckily, finally, we are now beyond flat file handling um, and single server solutions. Um, we in, uh, are happy to have horizontal scaling possibilities with the help of uh, OpenCGA. We already managed to extend uh, extend OpenCGA since it's an open platform with um, performing PCA on 500,000 samples. And we, uh, I also hope that I pitched the idea of transfer learning, uh, which we think is a promising avenue for understudied uh, populations. And um, yeah, we, we have done, we have conducted a proof of con a concept on simulated data, which at least has re realistic linkage disequilibrium patterns. But of course, we are really eager to perform this on the UK Biobank, which is um, well, the next uh, future step. And with that, I would like to acknowledge a um, couple of uh, people. So we have uh, um, our teams, uh, the um, Biotechnology Center team uh, um, lead, uh, led by Dr. Habiba Safar, who does all the sequencing genotyping. Then we have our high performance computing team. Um, then my particular um, work group with uh, Shafiq and Amira, uh, who did the comparison and the AI and uh, Mohammed Munib as well. And from statistics, I'm working a lot with Sam Fang, whom I'm very grateful for, for his input. And genotype amputation has been done by my student, uh, Rima Suwedi. And I'm also very happy with um, uh, um, I would like to thank uh, Yusuf Radua, who gave me an, uh, amazing clues during um, the last um, um, conference um, on the panoramic genome uh, on genomes. And um, also, I would like to thank the group in Dresden, um, whom we did the pancreatic cancer work. And um, yes. um, thank you very much. Thank you, Andres. I would like to now open okay. the uh, for discussion. Um, uh, um, I would like to welcome back um, Julia and Sharif. Um, uh, th this was actually a really fascinating talk. Uh, we got to learn about the infrastructure we actually need for to enable genome-based medicine. And we also got to hear um, like good success examples, both uh, from Julia and also from Sharif, the, uh, the, the one case where you were able to diagnose the disease in the second child, that was, that was just fascinating. So we have several questions here. Um, so I think the first question um, is um, to you, Julia. Um, 
Menahil asks, is there any criteria for proceeding to exome sequencing before or after other tests? Is the criteria no clinical diagnosis, confirmation of suspected diagnosis, et cetera? Yes, that's a very good question. And there isn't an answer that will cover all cases. So it's on a case by case basis. Uh, what we tend to do is we are very connected with the clinical teams. So we will discuss over the phone. And the questions that I would ask to the clinician is, how sure are you that this is this other disorder? Because if you are very sure and it meets all, all, all the, all the um, it has all the, the, the patient has all the cardinal features, and the likelihood that you are wrong is very small, maybe we can do that test first. Um, but in most of the cases, there are time pressures. Um, so most of the times the decision is, there is a tiny possibility that the clinician is wrong. Um, um, so let's go and take a, a, a catch-all approach and be, um, be sure that we don't cause any delays. Um, so yes, on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but we often go for the heavy-handed approach of, of just, just activating the exome. Um, I, I would like to tag um, on that question. So I am assuming that there are probably tests that are already in place um, in order to screen for some of these um, infant or newborn um, uh, diseases. Do you think genomics, um, either exome or whole genome sequencing, um, is it more accurate than those? Or do you think there is a scenario where genome sequencing will eventually replace um, these tests because it's probably because it's equally accurate, but uh, highly scalable? Excellent question. I, uh, <laughs> I sometimes being a geneticist, I like to be polemic, uh, controversial and say that actually, um, I think biochemistry is very strong and there are biochemical tests that can give you an answer really fast, really quickly and really cheaply. I think um, we need to use biochemistry more um, and we can't forget that um, our genetic tests are not accurate um, and we will still miss uh, uh, variants. So I, I, I think biochemistry has a very key role to play in many of these disorders. And don't forget experience. I mean, there are clinicians that can look at, at an MRI and make a diagnosis without needing uh, genetics. So I think everybody has a role to play and definitely genetics and genomics has a key role to play, um, but um, not always the central role. Okay, so the goal is not to like replace the already existing method, but it but there are other things that we can use. Yes. Use yes, it will it will play it will play a big part, but we will keep uh, many of the other tests that we have av available. So the, the the vision is that the UK will have the core um, tests and the specialist tests, and we are not going to throw away a lot of our experience uh, with other technologies. Fantastic. Um, I would like to now go to um, Sharif. Um, here's a question from anonymous attendee. Um, he says, great talk, Dr. Sharif. How scalable do you think um, GTRX is? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think scalability has, there's a number of ways to, different, to answer that. Um, so there's certainly laboratory scalability, right? And with a rapid genome, uh, you're limited. You are limited by uh, what how many samples a particular sequencer can sequence, right? Um, the equipment that you have internally, staffing. Um, and then scalability in terms of uh, how many, you know, genes with therapeutic approaches or diseases um, are actually out there that are relevant to mm, hereditary disorders, right? So I think there's a couple different ways, to, you know, to answer that. Uh, I think it's it'll get better, but there really needs to be collaboration amongst various different partners, you know, not only from the sequencing, from the informatics, but also, you know, I think from the medical community. I think it's a good start in the right direction um, because, you know, this type of format, you know, directly delivers actionable information, um, but there still needs to be a lot of curation that needs to happen. So one thing I didn't mention was that this particular uh, product or package, um, uh, has been developed by curating roughly about 500 or so disease genes associations at the moment. 
but those who are with the most relevant therapeutic um, applications. And so there's an expanding list of literature out there that's going on, and it's, it's a big effort to be able to curate all of these in the appropriate manner. So I think it still has some time to go, but you know, like everything else, as we've seen just from Julia's talk and Andreas, is that uh, that things are moving fast. Thank you, thank you. Um, so there is one aspect is how scalable the algorithm is, or how scalable sequencing is. Um, but I think there's also another aspect is how good is the EHR um, records and how many of those are available, is it not? Yeah, so that's always, a, that's always an issue. I mean, that's one of the advantages, I think, of implementing this type of testing within hospital intensive care unit settings, right? So there's a, a huge uh, mass of uh, a patient information within that, those medical records, right? And, and so that's, that's an advantage, you know, outside of, of, of doing this in the intensive care unit, going through somebody, uh, a, a person within the general population that has no known history of genetic disease, there's a, that's, that's a difficult task, right? So you're able to, you know, electronically um, interrogate um, and integrate within um, electronic medical record systems, you know, so that's, a, that's an advantage, advantage of having that um, particular environment, but uh, it, it is rich. And if you do it right, um, you should be able to, for the most part, weed out things that you're not interested in seeing. Okay. Um, Julia, would you like to comment on that? Any thoughts? Uh, no, I totally, I totally agree. I don't think I want to add anything else, but that was very well said. Thank you. Um, um, so I, I actually uh, have a couple of questions that um, are related to Julia's um, talk. Um, so um, our, an, an, I guess an, a different anonymous attendee um, uh, would like to thank you for your talk. And the question here is, how can we improve genetic counseling uh, for these sort of particular cases? There is actually another um, question that's also attached, which is, um, can you elaborate on the educational initiative uh, initiatives you plan to use. So if I, if, uh, allow me to like sort of rephrase these questions by putting this together. So what, what happens when somebody's diagnosed, right? Like, so there is educating the clinicians, there's probably educating the parents, and then there is also this issue of receiving treatment, right? So what happens, could you elaborate that what happens when somebody gets diagnosed? Yes, uh, let me try and, 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 and be concise. Um, um, we have monthly uh, um, education sessions for clinicians. So we advertise those um, um, online and run those online. Um, and um, th those have been quite useful. So we, we, do, uh, we do that uh, uh, um, always. And then what we then do is the just-in-time education. The just-in-time education is when somebody gets diagnosed, we approach the clinician, we arrange a phone call, we invite uh, 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 different specialities, and then we have that kind of uh, MDT uh, together. And um, that's quite effective um, as a way of educating because uh, it's real life, um, uh, real time, I should say, um, and, and we can address the questions that are that are on, on that moment. Um, and in terms of the question around how do we improve genetic counseling, there's a whole load of work being done in the UK on that. Um, and as a model of what you should be discussing with the parents before the test and then after the test and how to manage the expectations. And a lot of that work has generated uh, useful literature uh, and that's all available on Google um, to anybody really. Um, um, that's the model that we use in the UK, but anybody can access um, and, 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 and use um, that paperwork. Um, a, a lot of it is a checklist uh, of what you, know, you need to cover. Um, I, hope, I hope that answered your questions. Did I miss anything? No, I think, I think that was a fantastic answer. Um, thank you, thank you, um, and thank you for being on time. Um, now, um, we have a couple of questions for, for Andres. Um, so one question is, are there specific, well, uh, let me actually answer this. So are there specific regulations that govern the application of AI or machine learning in um, genomics in the UAE? And a second question that is also um, actually for you is, is there any um, UAE database for population genomics for um, uh, phylogenetic or ancestry determination 
which is the best third party software for handling SDRs and so for predicting ancestry. I, so if we were to like put these two together, the question is, are there any sort of like data sets that people can explore that is relevant for the UAE population? And while they are doing it, are there, should they be aware of certain laws regarding, you know, application, application of machine learning AI or other sort of like data share in the UAE? That's something specific. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for this um, for the questions. Uh, let me start with answering the second part. So regarding the um, uh, regulation or data sets available uh, that are available. So so I, I was a bit quick with one of the slides where, where I mentioned that our team um, has um, established an, a number of um, data sets, like for example, for the reference genome, um, there were 120 um, whole genome sequences and 33 exomes in, uh, involved. And while, uh, I mean, there are obviously privacy concerns. And um, so, but often when you go through the publication process, there is like um, certain, well, let's call it like a, like a certain agreements uh, with, uh, with the publishers. So, so often, there's of course a pressure from 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 the journal that this is public uh, it's supposed to be public um, while there are privacy concerns but um, there are possibilities to get um, access to those um, data sets that for example our our lab has provided so this um, just to summarize this we had 120 genomes um, 33 exomes and then uh, a thousand genotype arrays which were actually quite rich so they were each containing five million variants and um, if you don't clean them so and if you impute them so that's a poor man's genome, I would say, so for a thousand people. So, um, depending on what particularly, um, what are you particularly interested? In. For example, if you're just interested in in, uh, in ancestry, like one of the questions was about ancestry. So, I think that's that's a very um, helpful um, that's a very helpful data set. Then, so um, coming back to the question of AI being regulated. Um, so as far as I know, I don't think there is because uh, so far as computer science um, scientists, we, we have done all kind of algorithms uh, that we have thrown on it. And um, I, I see myself in a position where um, we are not yet, uh, well, we, we don't work that close with clinicians um, such that uh, cl uh, clinicians would just, just simply trust um, the diagnostics that comes from, from an AI, of course, that would be critical um, and liability would be uh, an issue. But um, I personally haven't, um, I don't know if, if Sharif had a similar experience because I, I saw he also used um, natural language processing and, uh, and various uh, machine learning techniques that are harder to explain. It's hard to, to know what's going on under the hood and it's difficult to assign accountability if you, um, but I, I personally see a bigger problem, for example, in database updates. There were a couple of cases where, for example, genetic disease, um, there were variants that were not not updated. And uh, I think it was a case where a mother it was very tragic, lost her child because um, a variant, um, uh, uh, so-called um, variant of unknown uh, concern uh, was not um, well described in in all the database version and keeping this um, updated is um, not always um, and yeah that's 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 uh, for me I think it's a bigger issue right now okay. thank you so much um, so there are a series of questions that have popped up in the last couple of minutes I'm going to try to pick a handful of them because we have a very um, few few minutes left. While I'm trying to pick the question, do any of the three panelists have questions for each other? Now will be the time. Yeah, Andreas, I, I noticed that, uh, so you, you detailed um, the program from, uh, I can never pronounce the name, from, uh, is it DNA Nexus? Um, the uh, informatics pipeline, Centayan? Um, yeah, how, how does it compare to uh, to Dragon? Oh, we, we get that a lot. So um, uh, Dragon, so we considered exactly the two of them, Dragon and uh, Centayan. And it was actually a, a Zeta Genomics that um, put both options uh, out to us. And so with Dragon, um, many, so 
Dragon drags you <laughs> into the cloud often. So I know you can also, um, so it, I think Dragon is either cloud-based or you have to install your own, um, so the, the hardware is different. I think as far as I know, Dragon is based on FPGA, which makes things very fast. But um, I heard it's, 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 first of all, quite expensive. So Centurion was for us the easier option because it's a drop-in re replacement for GATK. So that was a very quick, um, or in terms of um, you know, project management, that was a very quick um, adjustment. So we went with that. So that's not to say Dragon is worse, but it was just, it uh, would have been a, a bigger um, uh, adjustment for us. But yeah, ex excellent question, thank you. Uh, I don't know, do you use Dragon? Yes, yes, but uh, the, the Cention has come up more and more over time and uh, you know, trying to understand a little bit uh, about the different uh, pipelines of sensitivity, specificity, and, uh, and speed is important as well, right? So. Yeah, definitely. So we, we did not discover any, in terms of accuracy, we did not see any difference to, to GATK. So, so it was uh, pretty spill. I think there is fantastic opportunity for Andres and Sharif um, to exchange emails and 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 get this no. from us, right? The, one of the one of the benefits of all of us like coming together is so that we can actually continue to have these types of conversation um, after the meeting is over. I really want to end it today, but I have a colleague of my my Oda who has asked a couple of questions, so I cannot end before these questions are asked. This is absolutely my last um, question, but um, um, the but I, I have to take this. Sorry. Um, so my um, is um, thanking Andres for for this um, for your talk, uh, very informative, and I very much agree. So in your opinion, my ask is there um, still room for improvement when it comes to pre-processing the feature space for deep learning training? So that's her first question, and her second question is: Are there any publicly available UAE metagenome or sort of 16s rRNA datasets that are available? So. Um, this question could be answered by both Andres as well as Shadi. I think um, you know, it per pertains to both of your talks. So it will be actually interesting to get both of your, your opinions. I, I'm sorry if I take any question first. I, I love in particular the first part of the question. Um, so um, definitely, in, um, I think the uh, features, um, there, there's definitely a lot of work, so uh, I, I I don't think that uh, deep learning is a, is a silver bullet because right now it uh, it's it's not lending itself uh, so easily to it. So we already did some crude uh, filtering, but I believe there's plenty of possibilities. So if you look at um, the features, what are the features? They are the va variants, and these variants have additional uh, structure to it. They have, for example, uh, they belong to certain metabolic pathways. Um, there there's hierarchical feature spaces that we, we can integrate into that and and look at mutational burden into particular pathways. So that's that's another way of uh, feeding uh, or, or formulating features. So feature engineering, I believe, is still a very large topic and in particular also with a view on, um, on the explanatory power that I mentioned earlier. So if you, for example, see uh, if you have your feature space much reduced, but you talk about abstract, like let's say you, you see a high mutational burden in uh, I don't know, biogenesis pathways or, uh, or these kind of things, and you are closer to uh, getting um, a good uh, explanation from, from your neural network or from your machine learning tool. Um, so I think that's uh, definitely um, a good way. Uh, regarding metagenomics, um, yeah, we're doing that. Also, uh, University of Sharjah, a couple of others. Um, we worked actually in, in, a, in the context of COVID-19. We worked on on 16S. Um, I personally worked on wastewater uh, previously, in, where we did um, 16S sequencing. Full metagenomics, not yet, but of course that's also uh, yeah very important. Um, but um, yeah, I'm 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 very curious on uh, on developing further tools also for for microbiome data sets that we, um, well, right now focus mainly on 16S, but um, yeah, hopefully can extend that to full metagenomics. Thank you, Andres. So, I'm sorry, would you like to add um, anything to uh, yeah, Andres' comments? Yeah, just uh, the, the second part. Can you repeat the second part of the question? Well, the well, the first part was like, is there, a, when it comes to pre-processing the feature space or deep learning training, is there room for development? 
um, that probably was uh, more relevant to like what um, to, um, to your sort of my background. Yeah. So so you know I haven't had uh, a very hands-on experience right from with with NLP NLP other than working to validate it for specific you know disease phenotypes. I I will say however that this was not an, you know, an overnight process, right? So the validation process uh, is very detailed for this. You know, it took a few years to be able to get um, the entire infrastructure and, and work through these, these medical records and making sure that, that each of the terms were validated, not only automatically, but manually as well. So there's a lot of room for improvement. And I think Andrea said it good that there's a lot under the hood uh, for some of these things that uh, are hard to uh, weed out, um, simply because you're not developing it on your own, but it's it's developed uh, really well over the last few years. So I don't anticipate any reason why I wouldn't continue to develop and expand. Well, thank you very much um, for your answers, and thank you very much um, to all three of you for your time. Thank you um, to all the um, organizers, um, CAGS for um, having us all together in this platform. I really hope uh, that uh, our audience today um, enjoyed um, um, this, this session. I think um, I'm supposed to say a few things here. We, um, the CADS definitely needs your feedback. So um, please do fill in the short survey. The CME certificates can be downloaded as of tomorrow um, using this link. And please do remember that the next CAG seminar is on genetic counseling. Um, and there were several questions today. Um, here's the poll um, uh, on genetic counseling. Uh, it's taking place on 29th of September um, and the registration will open on the 1st of September um, at this link. So uh, please subscribe to um, PAGC uh, for further um, uh, updates. Um, with that, I would like to thank the panelists, our panelists, one more time. Thank you so much for your time um, and for all the information you provided. Um, and have a good afternoon. Have a good evening um, to those who are in the in the UA. Thank, thank you. So and, much. Um, thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, I guess you are celebrating because England going going further. It's a historic <laughs> in England. Wow, I'm talking to me. <laughs> I'm <German>. well, <laughs> well, you know, good luck. Good luck to your I home was, team. They I was about to, to remove the UK biobank after that game. I just. <laughs> no, it's okay. All the best okay. to the English team, of course. Have a, have a nice evening. Have a nice afternoon, everyone. Thank sure. you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye.